Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Nancy and Heather, for inviting us and convening this gathering. Um, we are so thrilled to have premiered the film The Janes at the Sundance Film Festival. Thrilled that the screenings uh, were sold out. So there was a, quite a lot of interest in, in this film. The film is a feature length documentary about the brave group of women uh, between the years of you know, 65 and 73, who organized a clandestine network of, uh, to provide abortions to women in need, to provide safe, affordable abortions to women in need. It's also a cautionary tale about the countless women who weren't able to access the Janes, who you know, still wanted an abortion because as we know, when abortion is legal, it doesn't mean that women don't have abortions. It just means they, you know, have to find alternative options. And so many women were injured uh, because they couldn't find skilled care. And many women ended up in the hospital in, in Chicago. It was the Cook County Hospital. So we also tell the story of the abortion ward in the Cook County Hospital and the doctor and nurse who firsthand helped women who had been injured, infected, and, and some of whom died. The film is a look at our past and potentially our future as we you know, confront barriers every day to women all over the country who are trying to get safe, affordable abortions 50 years later. And we also know that this disproportionately impacts poor black and brown, indigenous and rural women. So our film is an attempt to take viewers back in time and prepare them potentially for, for a future. I just shared my question. And then I shared my question. Oh, and just to introduce myself, uh, this is, I'm Tia Lesson. I'm one of the directors of The Janes and Emma Pildes, my fella director is here. And she also <laughs> produced the film uh, along with her brother and uh, Daniel Arcana, who originated the project. And we also have with us the wonderful, amazing, inspirational Heather Booth, who was the founder of the Janes. She she started this uh, this this organization uh, when she was a, a student at the University of Chicago, and she has since become one of the nation's premier progressive political strategists and organizers, uh, and continues to fight for women's rights and and civil rights and abortion rights. So J Heather, to you. thank you so much. And Shash, I'll come back to your question in just a minute, but. I wanted to particularly start by thanking Nancy Black Blackman, who is just such a, she's a film and documentary aficionado. She is an expert in uh, math education, but she is a passionate, dedicated, committed uh, person to so many values oriented uh, efforts that make this a better world and is persistent at a level that even when there's not a way, she finds a way. Uh, we first connected around a, a prior film on my life in organizing, and she's um, now expressed support for this film, and we appreciate your hosting this event. I also wanted just to give such appreciation for uh, Tia and Emma <laughs> for producing this remarkable film that's gotten, you probably have seen, but it's gotten just rave reviews in every location that I've seen. Washington Post, New York Times, Democracy Now!, uh, Variety, um, IndieWire, other trade publications. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it's not yet public. Uh, my understanding, um, and this gets to uh, Shasha's question just a bit, uh, that HBO, which is now sponsoring it, will, after Sundance, will consider the plan for both other festivals and then theatrical release and then broader release. And at some point there will be a major um, uh, campaign to promote the film. And all of us, uh, Nancy's creating an email list 
Uh, Abby Ginsberg's nodding. She is. I'm nodding. Great, <laughs> she's a great filmmaker herself. Uh, Abby, it was it was the film on Barbara Lee that you just recently did. Yeah. Which also is a terrific film. A uh, Barbara Lee speaks for me. The uh, um, one of the really fabulous leaders in Congress. Congress. Yeah. Uh, and, I wrote two uh, already. Progressive movement. I wrote. Um, so, so Shosh, uh, we will consider pulling out. Some, oh. No, you go. Well, I, I have something else I want to say, but you go, Shosh. Shosh, did you want to say something? Hi. Hi. No, no. I just I just put my question in so you can just read it and answer. Yes. And so I think that as part of, I'm not part of HBO, and it will largely be. I think we can decision. read the question. Can you read the question, Heather? Have you, uh, Shosh, why don't you say the question? Just say it. Um, I've got two questions. Have you considered pulling out some of the personal stories and sharing them on social media to reach a larger audience to help them understand the potential impact of making abortions illegal and inaccessible? And also, I'm curious, this is very much all the rave reviews are coming from the bubble, from the, you know, from, from one side of the debate. How are you gonna reach audiences from who have different perspectives? Because I, I assume that's really the goal. I mean, you don't need to get people to buy in who are already bought well, in. I right? actually, I've got questions about that. Let's Ooh. take them. Let's take them. Actually, Shosh, before we do that, I wanted to just finish the last uh, gratitude before we begin. Part of building a movement is expressing the gratitude for the things that are good. Often we achieve something and then we say, okay, on to the next battle. And we didn't realize at least appreciate what we did so far. <laughs> Often the struggle is so hard. But I did want to recognize Daniel Arcana, who is the first person who contacted me about the film. And that there are about 15 of the women in Jane in it. Uh, one of the policemen who made part of one of the arrests. Uh, that Mike, the one of the providers, the provider who taught the women how to perform the abortions. But Daniel did the outreach and he helped to convince people to be part of this because he was so caring, so persuasive, so filled with gratitude and um, just a great organizer. So I wanted to particularly appreciate him. And it's his mother and a member of Emma Pildes's family who was also one of the Janes who came in later. I actually had not known uh, her at the beginning because she wasn't, we, we didn't, part of the amazing thing about the film is there were different generations and some of us never even met each other because people are in, they move on, people come in. And then most of us haven't seen each other in perhaps 50 years. So this was also sort of a family reunion. Anyway, just to thank all of uh, all the people involved and uh, seeing those women in Jane was amazing. Several of them, by the way, have died. The two lead women, uh, Jody Parsons and Ruth Sergal, amongst others have died natural deaths, but I mean, it was tragic and far too young. And now back to Shosh's question. Um, Emma or, or Tia, do you wanna answer the first one about sure. using social media? And then I have a comment on the second one. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we're doing one step at a time here. So we're sort of trying to survive Zoom Sundance first and foremost. And then we'll have a few months. We don't have a specific broadcast date yet, but we have a few months likely before it's on the air and there'll be another big push then by the, by the network. Um, and so with that, I think we'll really come, you know, um, clips, social media, additional, you know, additional material that maybe wasn't in the film that, you know, could be per personal stories as Shash is suggesting. So I think there'll be a lot of opportunity. Like we are really just getting started um, with this film, you know, and it's off to a very good start. Um, it's very encouraging, but this is such a tiny, tiny bit. And then never mind all of the like um, hopes and dreams that we have as far as social outreach and and changing hearts and minds with the film. So I, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity for, for social media and additional material and, 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 and all of that. 
And I'll just add to that, you know, we, we really want to get this film um, out in the world. It's going to certainly be living out in the world even before the HBO broadcast to 80 million subscribers. It's go, you know, our hope is to create an outreach and engagement campaign and get it to abortion providers and reproductive justice groups and faith groups for choice, you know, student groups, uh, professional medical nursing um, associations that are that are fighting for choice. Also, you know, women's rights groups, civil rights groups, and and abortion funds. We want to lift up those struggles, those organizations, and we want to offer up the film and in hopes that it, they find it useful, you know, for, for, for their campaigns, for their organizing, for their education, and for their mobilizing. So there's going to be a whole lot of opportunity to do that in the coming, in the coming months. We're eager for ideas, and uh, we'd love to talk about how, how you all, you know, can find it useful. In terms of the social media, there's a limit to how much that we can actually put out there in advance of the film release. Uh, and that's not an HBO issue. They're incredibly 150% supportive of this film, but they, it's a limit um, on the part of, you know, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, because we also hope to do a run at, you know, uh, an Oscar nomination, uh, because there's nothing like that kind of visibility okay. to promote uh, to promote the film and also Okay, you know, the issues right. behind it. So oh, because of those rules, we could probably put about, you know, less than 10 minutes out yeah. there in social media, but there's going to be a lot of ways to, to get this to people. And we look forward to talking with you about that. Right. I wanted to say Shasha's, uh, to Shasha's question, and Shash, though we haven't met, but you've got a remarkable family. Um, it, it shows a political uh, insight in asking that question. So I very much appreciate it. But I have uh, two different kinds of thoughts on it. On the one hand, of course we need to get out of the bubble. And in part, uh, Tia described that, that those will be some of the ways. And you get an Academy Award, you're even nominated for an Academy Award. And people who would never think about seeing it suddenly see it. And part of what happens is when you see the movie, you see people's real stories and it changes it, it humanizes it. Um, so I think the insight you raise about getting out of the bubble is absolutely makes sense on the uh, promotional campaign. However, in addition, motivating and mobilizing our own base, the people who are already committed, including us who are on this call, is essential. Right now, our movement is dispirited. And we've had a number of difficult months. After all, we should remember where we came from. We came from an elation, electing a president, a Senate, a House, even by close margins. In DC, where I am, we were people literally the day after the election were dancing in the street. There were street corners with people with little celebrations, just waving at cars. I'm so glad, uh, you know, the witch is dead. <laughs> as, if, as if in uh, the Wizard of Oz, a ding dong, the witches. I mean, it was really uh, to come out of a Trump era when we didn't think we could. And the last year started out with a bang and then it's been hard. COVID has been very depressing. Um, and other, there are many forces beyond our control, whether it's Afghanistan or, um, or Ukraine now coming up, uh, what uh, the job, even things that are done well, uh, we, we're now at about 4% unemployment. It used to be seen that at 4% unemployment was seen as full employment, a nearly unreachable goal. And yet people are feeling the economy's not really working for them Many people feel that in their own life, though it's remarkable what's been done so far. So, Shash, even motivating our own base, I think, is quite important. And then for an electoral impact, if we get to vote and persuade to vote, our base who are four out of four voters, people who voted in a presidential campaign, and not even those who vote in midterms, just if we turned out those who vote in the presidential, or, or I'm sorry, in a previous midterm, plus 
those who are coming of age now and are our likely voters, we will win this election. And there is a pathway to victory as much as the naysayers are saying, I actually, I've got the list, I've just gone through a, an electoral assessment. The, the Senate races, the governorships, the House races, there is a chance of real victory in nine months, but we need to motivate our base and just as Shash says, get out of the bubble uh, and increase the support and involvement of those who are not yet involved. Are there other, there's so many things we can talk about <laughs> if given a chance, but are there other questions people have? I'm looking in the chat. Oh, someone asked about uh, Justice Breyer. Is there anyone who wants to comment on that or? Be glad to. I'm happy about it. <laughs> I, I haven't even read the articles yet. I mean, it's kind of breaking news, right? I mean, I was, I was hoping he would and it seems to me the responsible thing to do and and seems like you know and i hope that uh that biden will i mean I, it's i read i was reading today he said somewhere along the way on on the campaign trail that he would nominate a, a black woman or a woman of color so i do hope he i do hope he pursues that and sticks to his word but we'll see but it it, it is hopeful i mean that would be absolutely devastating of course to lose that seat so and they're younger people and people who've had a progressive record who are the two leading candidates. Um, I do wanna say it's again, a reflection of why we should take confidence. It is our movement for justice and democracy that made this possible. When uh, right after the election, there were organizations, I actually was working for one group called Demand Justice that was calling for Breyer to resign. And it was seen as shocking. In fact, it was sort of, have you gone too far? And it was a question. I wasn't even sure that I mm -hmm. want to be on that. I, I, I was working for, for that, but I had questions. It was that, uh, it's hard to remember when conventional win wisdom is seen as uh, nearly impossible. But because there's a movement that was calling for justice and for judges who knew what justice is, the movement persuaded Justice Breyer hmm. and persuaded President Biden, who is responsive and has said uh, he'll wait for Justice Breyer to make his announcement uh, and then he'll respond, but he's good for his word. Mm -hmm. Made that promise in South Carolina to name an African-American woman. Mm -hmm. So, but it reflects the strength of our movement. So we should take confidence in what we can do, what you all can do if you take action. See. I wanted to respond to Abby's note in the in the chat about you know these personal stories and Shosh, you know, and we so agree. I think that's why Emma and I we're really committed in addition to telling the story of Jane to include the voices of, of women who'd gone through, not only had gone through Jane, but who had, you know, other procedures, one, you know, through the mob in Chicago in the 60s, uh, one who came back to her dorm room and found, you know, her, you know, her dorm mate bleeding out because of a poorly performed abortion. And uh, and these are very powerful voices uh, that we really made, made sure to put in there. It, 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 didn't, it didn't take a lot. You know, there were, there were so many people with these stories and there's a new generation of, of people who did not live through this era that really need to be, you know, reminded. Mm -hmm. And then there was another question about mansion and cinema. By the way, this whole, there's not a format for this other than if you've got areas you want to dig into deeper, if you've got comments you want to share, your own insights, mm -hmm. if you've got questions, we're, we're glad to engage. So taking that comment about what will mansion and cinema do. Right now, by the way, for eight months, I've been working on Build Back Better 
which is the great investment program to cut child poverty in half, to uh, create universal pre-K, to uh, invest in climate and create good paying union jobs. Um, it's just an, an extraordinary program. We still believe some significant portion of that will pass with mansion and cinema support. So that's not over, but we need your help in promoting it. And the same is true on these uh, judicial approval of judicial nominations. And let's see, Ali Feldman, do you wanna say your insight that you posted? I just shared a tweet. Um, Santiago is, um, the, he leads Voters of Tomorrow. So if you're not familiar with that organization, it's a phen phenomenal organization of, of younger voters. And, um, and I'm just putting what he said. I think he's great. <laughs> so in the for what it's worth column. And I think that, and, and to that point, I'll add that there have been um, some recent uh, appointees who have had Republican support. So um, I know things are very polarized and uh, Congress is divisive, but I think maybe in the judicial area, we might, there might be some opportunity. And at the very least, we might have more support from Mansion Cinema. And the only way we'll know is if we keep organizing. The only way we'll know. But there are other, uh, let's see, Nancy. Nancy, do you want to raise the question sure. you just put in? Please share the history of the film project and how HBO got involved. Um, how do I keep this short and sweet? Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, D Daniel, as we said, you know, when, uh, when Trump got into office, it seemed clear that he was going to get into office and probably pack the courts and um, before we knew the real horrors that were before us. Um, he, he looked, or I've said this a couple of times, but it's the truth. He looked around and, and, and said, we're in trouble here. Um, so he, he started that groundwork with the Janes and um, reaching out to people and, and trying to get momentum there. Um, I have been producing for, you know, a very long time and a very long time with Susan Lacey and Jessica Levin first at PBS and then um, now for the last seven or eight years with HBO. And so Daniel and I uh, teamed up and started developing and working on this and putting a bug in the ear of, of Lisa Heller at HBO. And um, I was very happy producing and having a fine time. And so reached out to Tia, who I just admired so much as a filmmaker, um, had seen Trouble the Water a long time ago and meant so much to me. And so she seemed like a great fit for somebody that could direct this and that Daniel and I would produce and it would be lovely. And then, um, and then HBO came in with some development money really, really, really early. Um, and um, I think they saw the, the power of this film of the firsthand testimonies, they sort of got it in their, in their you know, experience and wisdom. Um, and so we went through that process, which was very fruitful. I think we did 11 interviews um and um and and then you know for for me personally i i i guess i sort of realized what i knew somewhere deep down which is that i had to direct this i was too committed to this and so tia and i decided to um do it together which was just the ex in the end the exact right thing i mean i'm just so grateful that it all worked out the way that it did. It was just such a, you know, I was, we, T and I were talking today and I used the word beshert. It was a little bit beshert the way it all came together. I mean, it really did feel meant to be. Um, so here, here a we go. It's a Yiddish phrase. Of, yeah. That it's yeah. meant to be. Yeah. 
So here we are. So that's the that's the long story. But I mean, it just it comes from a lot of um, commitment and and talent and um, and you know and even on the part of of HBO and and just like good eyes and ears for for projects that matter and you know might affect change. So we feel very lucky to have them as as partners on this so early on. And it certainly made the Sundance experience much easier than going as an independent film, which I can't even speak to. I, I came last time with Jane Fonda and Five Acts. So, I, you know, we had the support of HBO then too. But um, Tia has done that hustle. And um, so, yes, we're very grateful. By the way, this coming at this time, um, oh, I see Al Ali's hand, I'll just finish this short comment. Uh, not, so many things are coinciding. <laughs> um, later tonight, I'm speaking at a, I'm speaking at two other events tonight, not related to this officially. One of them, which was set up at least three months ago, is called Jane's Army. And it's a group of the pro-choice, of many of the pro-choice organizations in Illinois who are coming together because they were having their event relatively around the time of Roe v. Wade. Mm. And they're having a transition of leadership in, in the uh, leading uh, pro-choice organizations in Illinois. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the lead group, but anyway. Um, and uh, it's called Jane's Army. And so they're moving ahead, they're moving ahead and we've got the event and it's a you know, star-studded event. There's state legislators and all sorts of people going on it. And then it was only two nights ago that they said, oh my goodness, there are these two films and they wanted to know, could they show a clip? Could they promote it? Could they, it's like everything's coming together yeah. and forcing it. So that though the film was made and is just a great piece of film art, film documentarian, uh, skillful <laughs> film product, it's at the same time a movement building. And it's a tool that many people want to use. I was in touch with both NARAL and Planned Parenthood who asked if they could use it. Uh, how do they get in touch with it? And many groups will want to use it. But um, let's see, Rachel Roth had a comment and then Ali, did you have another comment? No, I, I really just wanted to follow up on what you're saying because that was about the question I was going to ask. Um, it was similar to what you're saying and I was just um, wondering if, I mean, this film is so powerful, it's so inspiring. And, and I realize in the era of the Janes, everything, like you said, was very clandestine. clandestine. Um, and and this film really pulls back the curtain. And I'm wondering how, and if possible, this, you know, in terms of organizing and bringing it out up to the open, and, you know, seizing the opportunity, this window of um, sharing the stories well beyond the film. And if that's, you know, how it might be able to, and maybe I'm just saying my thoughts out loud, you know, as a means of organizing. And I was really, I'm so curious about not only the women involved in Jane's, but the women who experienced it. And I feel like this gives permission in some ways um, to women who have held these stories so closely. And I know women who have had abortions and um, didn't tell their husbands and that was legally. So, I mean, I'm sensitive to the fact, like, you know, this sounds very grandiose. So I, I, I fully recognize that, um, you know, but in my, in my ideal world of having people being comfortable and sharing their stories, you know, what's the opportunity here and how it, it's, it might be possible in, in, in using this film to promote those conversations. Well, I, I can speak from my past experience. I've been a filmmaker for 30 years and I've every film I've worked on has had an engagement component to it. It's just part of the importance of this media. And um, with my film, Trouble the Water, which was about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and followed these uh, Katrina survivors through the recovery, um, the long, through the hurricane and then the recovery, we were blown away by the number of groups that reached out to us and the breadth of the groups. They, they were groups in, interested in racial justice. They were groups interested in, in, in urban development and rebuilding. 
Um, it, there were uh, philanthropists who were eager to use the film to talk about how money impacts the conversation about economic and racial justice. There were schools, classrooms, college, you know, and high school classrooms around the country that 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 got screeners of the film. And we actually created, with the help of the Ford Foundation, an educational curriculum, uh, not just for the classrooms, but also for community groups. So there are just so many ways, um, in addition to a broadcast to an 80 million base subscriber that HBO has. There's so many ways, you know, to, to engage people in conversation and hopefully, you know, in action. And I'm just really excited about that. One of the, to, to address an earlier question about the faith groups, um, one of the revelations that Emma and I had in making this film was the role of the clergy, not early on in opposition to abortion rights, but actually helping people, helping women um, find providers, ferrying them to, to Japan and England and then to New York when it was legal. There were the clergy consultation service all over the country that, that originated in the uh, Judson Church in New York City um, had legions of, of rabbis and Protestant ministers and people of all denominations that were helping counsel women and take care of women in need. And we were able to put a spotlight on the Chicago branch of the clergy consultation service uh, through an interview with uh, two of the members. And I think it's really gonna be, it was, it was surprising for us as filmmakers to learn about this story. I think it's gonna be surprising for audiences. And we hope that, and I, I put in the chat some of the groups for choice, Catholics for Choice, Methodist Federation for Social Action, Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism, Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, United Methodist Women, Women of Reform Judaism, Unitarian Universalist Women Federation, and National Council of Jewish Women. These are all groups that are very, very active and vocal um, around choice. I think Rachel Roth also had a question. Um, thank you, I do. It's more about the film and less about activism. So I don't know if Please. people want to shift. Okay, so um, as I was saying, when I put in the chat, you know, I had seen the film that was made in 1996 um, when, when Jody and, and Ruth were still alive. And it does, um, it, it does, like there's a lot of um, synergy, I guess, between that film and, and Laura Kaplan's book, like Jody says some of the same things in, in both. Um, but anyway, in this film, you had, well, there were some of the same people speaking in this film also, and then people I had not encountered before, um, including, for instance, the, the man who was um, the abortion provider, you know, who wasn't a doctor and who, um, you know, wound up teaching other, teaching some of the genes. So I, anyway, I was curious just about um, if you had any comments about was that just because you were able to track him down or because some people felt like it's far enough away now, I'm more comfortable. Like one of the women in the earlier film wore huge dark sunglasses and a scarf. So you really couldn't um, see her so much. So anyway, that was, that was very interesting to me just seeing these other um, people who were in the film that, that I, like I said, I hadn't um, encountered before. Daniel, do you wanna speak to that? Muting myself there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's it's interesting. I I mean, I remember when Kate and Elle were making that film. Um, I actually kind of helped them almost like a just in film school at that point, and I was helping them as kind of a production assistant. <laughs> so it's, it's fun uh, to think back to that. But um, yeah, at that time, I think you're I think you're exactly right. I think it was still it still felt a little too present and a little too soon for some of those women to be public and show their faces and speak on camera. Uh, I know several of them were, were frightened. Um, I mean, frankly, it's worse now, uh, but, um, but yes, that's, that's definitely the reason. And, and of course, you know, taking that into consideration, when we, when we did our outreach, I mean, we tried, we tried to reach everybody. You know, I mean, I literally went through an exhaustive list of every single name, 
every single participant, anyone who I, who I could find who was involved to see, you know, who was interested, who was available in participating. And uh, I think we were very, very fortunate to get a lot of new participants. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were so many like breakthrough moments, you know, like finding Mike was a breakthrough moment for us. You know, we, we, we had almost given up <laughs> on, on being able to find him. Um, and, and there were several other participants who were, who were, you know, pretty staunch holdouts right up until, uh, you know, even into production. Um, so yes, but, but I think eventually people were very comfortable and, and also I think a point that, that both Emma and Tia have made on several of these other, uh, Q and A's, the situation just continued to get more and more dire and more and more present. I mean, it, it stopped being something that was outside and it started being something that was spilling into your actual living rooms, right? And so at, at that point, I think they all just said, yes, of course, we're going to help you. We're going to answer that call because we have to. Thank you. That, that makes sense because you explained if you started when Unnameable was elected and then you know, <laughs> we saw what happened in Texas and all of that, that, you know, um, that makes sense. I just wanted to say also that you're, I went to a screening at Simmons College in Boston with the filmmakers and your mother. Oh, with, with Kate and Ellen, my mom? Yeah. yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, we <laughs> let's be clear, we're, we're hoping for a day when this film is no longer relevant, where it's ancient history, you know, and it's not, it's not a joy for us to see how urgent this issue is you know we, so it's really it's but all along the way in the making of the film you know there were these milestones and we were noticing you know that um that we better hurry up and finish it <laughs> because before it's before the roe versus wade is completely decimated or overturned um, Rachel, what was what's your background, and what does your T-shirt say? So I don't know if you can see it. I'll see that it, it says repeal. Hmm. And um, I don't know is anybody familiar with anybody else have. So I I was fortunate to live in Ireland during the campaign to change the oh. constitution. So they had to repeal the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution hmm. in order for Parliament to legis you know past legislation allowing access for abortion. So that's that's what this is. Um, and my background, I'm kind of activist, feminist, reproductive justice activist, independent scholar, organizer, also do work trying to shrink the impact of imprisonment. I live in Massachusetts where, you know, things have gotten better. We've gotten um, the old criminal laws off the books. We've passed things that um, they don't just, you know, abortion is secure here. Um, but, um, you know, we're still trying to make progress on other things like better access to abortion um, and to full spectrum pregnancy care. Um, so anyway, there's always lots, there's lots to do everywhere. Where, where did you say you're located? Right. I live in, I live near Boston, Massachusetts. Oh. You know, Skona, you had a comment about um, how <laughs> disproportionately Jewish the faith organizations are. And I wanted to give just a personal comment on it. Um, I don't think this is in this film, but in um, other films <laughs> touch on the issue of, uh, some other films tell a little bit of this story. Um, I got involved in this issue, not as a political issue, but as a moral issue. A friend was in need. I thought I'd do a good deed for a friend. In fact, I mostly thought I didn't know what to do. I hadn't really thought about the issue. I didn't know where to go, but I found a doctor. One led to the other, word spread, and, and that story is covered. But part of the reason I viewed it was a moral issue is partly I'd been in the civil rights movement, but I also have been brought up Jewish. Yeah, and I believe Jewish and social justice were the same thing when I grew up. 
it's not necessarily true, but it was true for the tradition I came out of. Reform Judaism for sure, yeah. Well, it's even, Skona, it's, it's even a little more complicated. My mother's family was Orthodox. Uh, <laughs> we initially were conservative. It's, yeah. it's more, it's, it, 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 in Judaism, there's, and in every religion, but the, the statement of justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. Why in the Bible does it say justice twice? It's rare to have the same word repeated twice because it's that important. Or in the holiest day of the Jewish year on Yom Kippur, um, Isaiah says, is this the fast I command of you? It's a day of fasting to sit in sackcloth and ashes to show how penitent and how faithful you are. And he says, no, what I command of you, what I commend you to do is to break the bonds of wickedness and let the oppressed go free. It's a very activist approach. So there is that part of the tradition. But what I want to say also is that there was a 30 year hiatus in which there was much less social justice reality in the Jewish community. And it was much more divided. And uh, in the late 90s, there was an attempt to reinstill social justice in the community. And now there's a flowering. I mention it because my own view is social justice and organizing should never be taken for granted. It all depends on what we do. And this film is such an amazing uh, impetus for saying, don't just watch, don't just say, ain't it awful? Don't just say, why aren't they doing it? Don't just say, oh, they're not doing it right. Or I wish they were doing this. It's up to us, what will we do? Will we fund things? Will we send out the messages? Will we make the films? Will we publicize the films? Will we take action? Will we do legal work? Will we do legislative work? And particularly this year, will we organize now for the 2022 elections? Yeah. Why was there that 30 year hiatus? Because we because we'd won, I mean. No, it's, it's yeah, a, that war was over. by the way, I'd say, I give perhaps two talks a week on different subjects, uh, not mostly on chain, though now it is, but, um, and I'd say a good portion of them, a quarter of them, 20% of them are within the Jewish community. So I have many thoughts about this. And what I would say is that many things coincided. By 1968, the Black Jewish Alliance had begun to fray. Dr. King was killed. The last whites who were often in the Black community were Jews who were either landlords, some were government, uh, worked for government. Who did they see? And uh, as James Baldwin once said, where there was a rise in anti-Semitism in the Black community, it was reflecting really a rise of uh, being, realizing what white people were doing to Black people. And it was a response there. So that was part of it. I think the centrality of Israel in the uh, Jewish community meant there was an inward focus on those issues. Um, there were concerns about, as opposed to an outward focus, uh, there were concerns about uh, continuity in the Jewish community. If you're, you know, Jews, I don't know, maybe you started 3.5% of the population, you're down to 2.8% of the population. You think, well, with intermarriages, you can even continue. And, there are many things that developed, a lot more to the story, but Leonard Fine, who some of you may know, who was the founder of Moment Magazine, Maison, and the Jewish Literacy Project, and also did the social justice outreach for the Religious Action Center out of Reform Judaism, he initiated a project with a remarkable woman named Rachel Cowan. And there's a movie about Rachel's life. I think it's called This Doesn't Feel Like Dying. It's the story of her final death, but she became a rabbi and promoted Jewish social justice. And for many reasons, there's now a reflowering. Thank you. Are there other questions or areas you'd like to hear about? 
or people from other faiths to talk about those backgrounds. It's <laughs> I have a few questions. Um, doing 11,000 abortions is a huge number. Uh, how, how did that number come about? I mean, were abortions done every day of the week or? Um... Uh, Heather, do you wanna? Um, well, I was not involved as, it, as the numbers kept growing and growing. Uh, I stepped aside and others were doing it, but there were about a hundred women who were part of the Jane service who were staffing it. Not all of them did the abortions, but there were so many other roles that are very well portrayed in the film. Um, and the numbers were increasing as publicity was increasing in part because there wasn't that level of attack that there is now, the women became increasingly public and there were ads taken out in local papers. We put up signs on call boards and supermarkets. Again, it's covered in the film and said, pregnant, need help, call Jane. We would publicize it. And at that level, it says this in the in the movie, so I'm just repeating, but first it was, I was at the University of Chicago, it was first college students, then it was Midwestern college students, then it was women, ooh, um, then it was uh, more women, working class women in Chicago. And then as abortion became pub, um, legal, it was legal in, always legal in some of the Scandinavian countries and then legal in Hawaii, uh, New York and California. If you had money, you went there. And so poor people and particularly women of color became the larger population and the numbers just increased. You, I think you know this, I don't think this is said in the movie, but you may know that one in four women now, it used to be one in three women, but it's now one in four women one in four people of reproductive age will have an abortion. I've never had one. So I always think, okay, I'm counting. Nancy, Heather, Sc Scona, Allie, that's four. One of you three. Okay, Emma, Abby, Rachel, Tia. One of you four. Missy, I mean, as you go through. And this is true in the population. It is true, not quite equal in every part, but similar across race, region, religion. Um, and until recently, it was more common amongst younger people, but many of the women who came through were women who already had children, were middle-class housewives. By the way, most of the women who were the Janes some were students, but most were middle-class housewives. That's true of the two women who really led the effort. We've referred to Jody Parsons and Ruth Sergal. Ruth was a social worker. Her first child, which she had, was, uh, she's not sure what Ruth wants to share, but both Jody and Ruth have died, but was a severely disabled child. She lovingly raised that child and decided that other women have the right to their choice as a social worker. And Jody tells her story where she almost died, where she almost died from an abortion. And it was the, and her life was at stake because she had, uh, she had cancer and some other diseases that finally killed her at a very young age. And she still couldn't get a legal abortion. Her story in some ways parallels the story in um, Call Jane. Yeah. Um. Are there other? I was just gonna say that in 1969, statistics say that approximately a million women had illegal abortions across the country. And Professor uh, Leslie Regan at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana estimates about 50,000 
women at abortions in Cook County. You know, so that we know that, of. That we know of. All right. The the Janes had a very sophisticated operation, you know, and they they you know were able to offer deep discounts and also you know offer the service entirely for free once they began to do the abortions themselves. And they could see upwards of a hundred women a week at at I guess at the height of at the height of it. I know when they were busted in 1972, there were a couple hundred women, you know, who had no recourse. They, they had to go elsewhere. They were on the waiting list. And the women of Jane did make those arrangements. By the way, you captured that so lovingly in the film. Um, I have some other things I can share, but I, 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 did you have another question or were there other comments or questions people have? We have perhaps another 10 minutes on this call. I'm curious about what the reaction was of the people when you approached them to, to invite them into the movie, like Mike or some of the women, or were there women who weren't comfortable appearing? I think you mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but I can't imagine after 50 years, somebody knocking on your door and asking about, you know, involvement in the genes. I'm just curious about that personal piece. Well, I, I think, I think they've been being approached, you know, I mean, I don't, I, there was no shortage of people knocking on their door. There's been, you know, we talked about the, the film that came out in the 90s. There's been some long form magazine articles about them. There's Laura Kaplan's book. Um, so people have been knocking on their door. You know, I think the combination of that we have, Daniel and I have a family connection to the story worked in our favor um certainly access is you know a good thing to have when you're making these documentaries um and then it and then what daniel said which is you know which is just the, the timing of, of it all i mean this is a this is clearly a, a um group of people that feel uh deeply responsible for their fellow um man and woman, you know, for their brothers and sisters and have a, 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 a conscience that that calls them into action, you know. So the fact that when they, they were trying to take it easy, <laughs> they've already put in their time, but the fact that it got so bad again and they became sort of the elders with the, you know, maybe the knowledge um, and the know-how, um, I, I, I really think that they, they felt that responsibility again. And again, they were so deeply moral and ethical and um, felt so much responsibility for each, all of us, each other, that, that they were willing to, you know, get back, get back and, and, and do something again. So, you know, I, I think it's fam I think it's family and I and I think it's it's the consciences and the time of these people and the timing of these people. Um, you know, I think some of them were not thrilled to get in front of the camera. It's not for everybody, you know. I don't like it. <laughs> I like being behind the camera. Um, so I get it, you know, and but I but but they were but they were willing. Some of them took, like Daniel said, more convincing than others. Um, but they were, they were willing. So I wonder, Daniel, since you made the first approach to a number of the women, did you want to say anything else on this? Yeah, the only thing I would add uh, just, just to tout the amazing filmmakers here is I did throw their names around quite a bit. <laughs> so that helped, you know, uh, I mean, everybody, knew Tia's reputation. They had seen the films that Emma had produced. I mean, clearly these were very serious people who were going to make a very serious film. And, and I think a lot of the inquiries that they got, they were, you know, like Emma said over the years, they're very, very skeptical of 99.9% of, .9 of these inquiries. And they do say no to most of them. Uh, and they were very frank with me about that. But um, 
but yes, you take those those components and and uh, the incredible skill and reputation of of this team, uh, and I think that was that was persuasive. Well, and Heather, can can you speak to it? Because I remember very having a very long phone conversation with you um, before before we sat down with you and um, and I and you had some very good questions about what what our, what our intentions were so I think I think you were you know you were very welcoming but I but you you know you're a busy lady <laughs> and yeah. maybe you can I mean, speak to, partly, to that you know it was illegal and so someone says i want to do a story on it first of all who are they i have been the subject of a, of a few sting operations i'm actually <laughs> indirectly related to a major lawsuit against breitbart in which we actually think we are going to win for substantial funding where he tried to undermine a consulting group that i'm part of and had terrible consequences they put someone in with a wire who listened to private conversations without our permission and then misinterpret misrepresented them. This wasn't a film. Well, actually, then they may well, they wanted to make a film about it. But so we didn't know who the people were. And also you can say you're one thing, but if you don't know people, you have to find a way to, to vet who they are. And so I loved the idea. And I wasn't sure. So you partly say, well, do you know so and so? And what did you do and what was your own background? Are you just, are you interested in this or did you ever do anything? <laughs> so you know what life is like Hello. to do things. Yay. Anyway, I also felt, I just fell in love with all three of you and the others who are associated with the film. I did call Judith Arcana and I did call Laura to, because they had been primary sources and I wanted to make sure, in fact, there was some confusion because there were other films being made and there were rights being discussed and I didn't want to get crosswise of them. That was actually a concern I had, but it all worked out. Anyway, I'm very grateful, very grateful. I, I am gonna to have to leave just around six, which it almost is now, and Anne Common has a comment. Anne, as the last comment or question, do you want um, to say something? My question is about Mike and the cops' involvement, how you got them involved, your sense of how they felt about doing it. Um, I can I can speak to Mike. Do you want to do you want to talk about the, our friend, the police officer, first? Because he's so fantastic. <laughs> uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Talk about Mike. Uh, okay. Well, well. It turns out that Mike um, was actually a very close personal friend of the Parsons family. That's Jody. Uh, and as well as, as with um, Mickey Weiner. So that was a pretty tight knit group. And um, Jody's daughters had actually stayed in touch with him. And so after a fair amount of sort of digging and prodding and convincing, uh, they finally kind of gave up that information. And um, as soon as they told me that they, they had actually still had a, a number and a location and all that, um, we all literally piled into the car together and drove out to see him and uh, sat with him in his kitchen. And over the course of several hours, we, we convinced him to, to do this. And it was tough because he, his family did not know anything about this he'd never spoken really? about any of yeah he'd never spoken about any of this publicly uh ever like literally ever and um so it was it was a big it was a big get for us we were, we were excited that he finally was willing to talk about it and 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 i can't even tell you how thrilled all the james were because they still had so much affection for him um i mean he was literally their friend and their mentor and taught them how to do it and i mean it just you know he, he really was kind of one of a kind or in, in heather's case had never never seen his face once in her life yeah that i had only worked with him yeah. through an associate but i wanted to say 
one other thing about the remarkable nature of this film. There have been other films made about Jane. There are other fictionalized versions. There's The Call Jane, there are other films. Almost all of them for artistic license and dramatic tension <laughs> that they felt they needed to create. They make the guys in the situation, the doctors, the providers, the husbands, seem like <laughs> they play up the negative side of their characters. Even if they have positive sides, they play up the negative side. And some of the other films, not the one uh, so much at, at Sundance, uh, it makes one, he's just so awful and obnoxious, you want to throttle him. And I, I continue to think. The reality is so much more dramatic than even the wonderful, and I do think they're wonderful, Hollywood made version. And I'm grateful for it because the star power of that film will also elevate this film. But the true story that Tia and Emma and Daniel were able to really capture on screen is so powerful. Anyway, thank you all. I am going to run. I didn't know, Nancy, if you want to say a last comment. Well, thank you so much for being willing. I thought I lost the recording from, um, from yesterday. And I was thinking, what can I do that I lost the recording from January 24th? And then it occurred to me, why don't I make a new recording? <laughs> and so that's why this recording came to be. So thank you for attending this recording. And let's try to make our disappointments into into um, you know doing good things coming out of them. So if you're disappointed with something, with some Supreme Court ruling, try to make it different. Just because you had one disappointment doesn't mean you should stop. And thank you for indulging me and letting me have yet another discussion. Thank you, Nancy, for doing it. You're doing wonderful work by creating this place for everybody to talk. It's really great. They may need support for the further promotion. So yes, and I'm going to work on trying to raise money for outreach. I mean, I met Heather Booth by by offering her outreach for her the wonderful film about her that I highly recommend that you watch after this. Um, the Booth call the film called Heather Booth Changing the World. Um, I felt wonderful about it and followed up with Heather and decided to support their outreach campaign. And since then became friends with Heather. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, great great. Great. Thanks. Nancy. We're so yes. grateful to Thanks everyone. for all of you, our partners in the movement for justice, equality, and full participation in the Society for Women. The struggle continues. <laughs> and so does our sisterhood and oh. brotherhood as we move on. Thank you. Thank you.